Hello and welcome to Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we're talking about The Birdcage today. A 25 year old film at this point. Yes. Um, as you were just remarking, and I was thinking at the start, you know, I think if this was made today in the same way, things, certain things would not fly. That is true. <laughs> um, Which is a shame because I had a fantastic time. I think it's Mike Nichols' best film. Yeah? Yeah, I do. I was, uh, you know, because I've just read this biography. Uh, by Mark Harris on Mike Nichols, and it's an extraordinary life. Uh, And this, maybe aside from The Graduate, was his biggest hit. I mean, this made $157 in the U.S., so, you know, a huge, huge hit. On a $31 Uh, million budget. Written uh, by Elaine May, uh, and, you know, the writing is fabulous. But anyway, just to go back to to the life, I was thinking they're all kind of... Quality films are all serious projects. A lot of them are literary adaptations or adaptations of plays, mm. right? Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, things like that. As this is as well. As this is. Um, but none of them are my favorite films. Yeah, the, mm. you know, they're always worthy, yeah, with good moments, but, you know, kind of none of them are my favorite films. Uh, and some of them are, are not very good at all, really, you mm. know, like I think Woolf. And some are forgettable. I mean, I think the one with Harrison Ford, Forgetting Henry or something like that, I, I saw it. I remember going to see it. But I can't remember anything about it, really. Mm. Um, he's a director who's fabulous with actors, who kind of um, made his reputation that way. But really, aside from The Graduate, which, you know, I've never really liked, actually, though, you know, it's a landmark classic. It's a cultural classic. I saw it played on a huge screen in Bologna, and it really played, yeah, like, mm. you know, there was, like, an incredible reaction from the audience. So, you know, I just think that maybe the fault in, in that maybe is me. Um, but, you know, his career after the 1980s, uh, he did Gilda Radner's live film, he did Silkwood, The Loxy Blues, which is just a Neil Simon adaptation in which, again, you know, Matthew Broderick was very charming, but very forgettable. Postcards from the Edge, which has wonderful moments, but, you know, also has, like, dull passages, really. And then, you know, the one that you might have seen are Closer and Charlie Wilson's War. I haven't seen Closer. I'd, I'd heard that Closer wasn't very good. The one I have seen is Primary Colours, which but I liked enormously. I like that enormously as well. And interestingly enough, that's also written by Elaine May, I mm. think. Yeah, and John Travolta, I think, is wonderful in that, actually. Yeah, and um, it has a similar dismissively scathing attitude to the kind of cravenness of politics that this does. Yes. Okay. Um, but, I mean, I think this is a genius of a film, actually. I mean, it's a farce. It's very theatrical mm. in every way. Oh, absolutely. Actually. I mean, it's, it's about the build-up to the chamber play, which yeah. is the second half of the film. That's right. Uh, and even things like the musical numbers or the pratfalls or, you know, it is like a, a, almost a theatrical comedy of manners, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I actually I don't remember laughing so much in a film. No, you have not laughed so much in a film to the point where actually you were drowning out some of the dialogue. Yeah, sorry. Was I, was, I, was, I was hurting my rib, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, were really laughing going for it. so much. Uh, it was extremely funny and all the laughs were earned. I mean, it's an interesting thing because you were saying um, some of the pratfalls were cheap. And, you know, they were, but at the same time, you didn't feel like you'd been manipulated into no, laughing. No, they all worked. They, they work and they come out organically. They just they make sense. The characters make sense. It's enormously funny, and also you just mentioned off hand halfway through. God, it's, it's such a great script to lend me, such a great writer, and it really is. Yeah, I mean, it really properly is. Like, there's just su- there's such a delicate balance. Actually, it works very, very well with Robin Williams and Nathan Lane as well, especially Robin Williams. Their performances match the script in that there's this really delicate balance of really heartfelt, serious, meaningful character moments and funny lines Hmm. you know whether it's a funny line that a character actually means that very often a character is making a joke and it's a snarky joke or whatever it might be but they're they're deliberately making you know funny comments or whether it's a joke for our benefit that the characters don't really see this gets laughs from everything Hmm. you know from decor from intonation from the books that people were reading just like everything really you know, and the actors are genius, right? The way they walk becomes a laugh or, yeah, kind of mm. everything, really. A hand gesture, 
an intonation, the, the repetition of a phrase, right, becomes kind of an occasion for a laugh. I think it's, I, I, I don't think I've, any, I've seen yeah. anything this good, really, you know. And while it's, yeah, exactly, it's choreographed and it's prepared. And you actually, you can see it playing on a stage. You yes. can see how the scenes were playing on the stage and they work very, very well there as well. Yes. The script is, is that sharp. So we should maybe just quickly say what it's about, because there may be people who don't know The Birdcage. I didn't actually know what The Birdcage was about. Oh. I'd been looking forward to seeing it for a while, and I think I'd mentioned to you some time ago, oh, I'd like to watch this, and maybe you just weren't in the mood that day or something, so I didn't, and I've been waiting to watch it. Hmm. So it's adapted from Le Cage au Fol, but I also didn't know what the Le Cage au Fol was. So it's this uh, gay couple, which in this is uh, Robin Williams and Nathan Lane, and Robin Williams' son, who's 20... Uh, shows up one day. Oh well, I should say the gay couple uh, run a nightclub called mm. Birdcage, a drag club, and it opens on this wonderful scene of um, show tunes and whatnot in the nightclub, and also Nathan Lane upstairs crying hysterically that he's not being respected and so on. <laughs> uh, Robin Williams' son comes home one day, and he's twenty years old, and he's met Callista Flockhart, who he wants to marry. Callista Flockhart's dad is a very, very conservative senator, and his wife with him is you know part of the political partnership. And he's just been involved in a terrible scandal where his partner in this moral organisation that they have has been caught or died yes. uh, having sex with a black underage hooker. So the families are destined to meet. The conservative parents are going to come over to the gay parents for dinner and they've not been told that the parents are gay. They've not been, they've been told it's a regular old heterosexual mother and father relationship. They've not been told the, the nightclub or anything like that. And of course the press are chasing them as well. And the son manages to convince his dad to turn his life briefly straight and take away all of the extremely camp decor and try and keep away Nathan Lane, who's extremely mm. uh, campy and, um, what's the word, uh, queeny, I suppose. Yes. Uh, and, of course, it all goes wrong. And I must say, the thing, what I actually liked, I liked the film throughout, um, but the first half, when it's the build-up, to the evening and the preparations and the kind of the shifting relationships you know so initially Robin Williams is not happy about this he doesn't want to have to pretend that he's not who he is for a night yes. and when, in fact when he says that to his son I went good for you mm. you know and then of course he does because that's how the second half of the film is going to happen then Nathan Lane you know they try not to tell him he finds out He's very, very hurt, and then he kind of understands, and then he's hurt again. And Actually, I want to um, interrupt there for a moment, because I do think that Nathan Lane's performances is one of the greatest in film history, mm. really, one of the greatest ever. And part of the reason why is because, you know, and people say this about great, great, great performers, and I very rarely experience it. I mean, I actually can't remember, you know, but there's, there's no one I can think of at this moment who makes you laugh and cry at the same time. <laughs> and actually, there were moments with Nathan Lane where he was so hurt and betrayed. And I found myself welling up, right? Because you can understand yeah. why he's so... He, I mean, here's a, a child he's raised his whole life and loved, and now he does... Yeah, he wants to shun him in public. He wants to pretend that it's, yeah, they don't have yeah. a relationship. I mean, that's heartbreaking. And it really made me... It really made me well up. And then a second later, he says something, and you can't help but laugh, yeah. right? So... You know, these actors who can make you laugh and cry at the same time, practically. I mean, this... Uh, uh, well, that's the genius. magic of his performance. So the magic is that he gets hurt. He's hurt in a very queeny way. Yeah. And that's very funny. Because he's always hurt in an over-the-top way. Or in a way that he he's, he's hurt for real reasons and in real ways. But what he says doesn't quite match what you think. You know, so he, like, he'll be hurt that, you know, he... did. He'll be hurt in a very real way, but then it'll be about his eyebrows don't do right or something like that. Like that's not the real thing here, but that's what matters to him, or that's how he expresses it in this moment, and that's what's funny. Yes. Um, well, I think I think what's important is that you feel the hurt. Yeah. And you share it with him, right? You know, and then there'll be an intonation or a twist, or that'll just make you laugh out loud, and it happens all the time. You know, and in different ways, right? Like, the performance is genius because so much of it has to do with movement or hand gestures or voice intonations, right? I mean, it is something that you have to be, like, super skilled to do. To even think of that is, you know, kind of quite extraordinary, yeah? Mm. But you can just raise your voice a little bit and that will get you a laugh. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Or, 
or at the beginning when he's hiding, the way he's got his legs shaped yeah. is funny, right? Like, yeah. you know, so kind of, I mean, to even think of, about it, I think is kind of quite extraordinary. Uh, and I think the film, so when you were saying a lot of it wouldn't fly now. Well, yeah, I want to get back to this. Yeah. I think, well, maybe it's a pity that a lot of it wouldn't fly because on the one hand, you can understand why it wouldn't fly, right? Well, I want to think about what wouldn't fly. Because yeah. So what, what wouldn't fly to you? Well, I think what, I, and when I say what wouldn't fly, I'm really thinking about like what would get a Twitter backlash, uh-huh. you know, and I think the Twitter backlash would be, for one thing, straight people playing gay. I think, yeah, and especially so campy. Well, Nathan Lane is gay, but um, mm. uh, Robin Williams, Hank Azaria are not. And I think that wouldn't fly. And also Hank Azaria playing Guatemalan, as he does, mm. would get a really awful response. Why? Isn't he Puerto Rican or something? He's Hank Azaria. He's mm. American. I know, but I think he is of Puerto Rican or, or Well, I'm not sure it would... Well, I think, I think it would get a... He's Latino, is what I'm saying. Right, yeah. But he doesn't present as... Um. Sort of what he presents. Them. I think. I think there might be an issue. I think people would find issue with that. They would like to take issue with that because I think they would see the broad strokes, and there are some broad strokes in the performances. Uh-huh. But the thing is, what you actually see, which I think is where the film is so brilliant, is you see the humanity, mm-hmm. and you see the film basically saying that these gay people who are as campy as you like are real normal human people who have real normal human feelings. And that's what you get at underneath everything. You even get that in Hank Azaria's character, even though his is much more of a sketch mm. than Nathan Lane's. Um, but I think people would be keen to see past that, you know? I mean, maybe I'm just being judgmental of Twitter or whatever, but my initial response was, wow, this is kind of... <laughs> this is bold. Mm. Um, I mean, to me, the issue more is that the film is quite conservative or quite heteronormative, as you know, people would say now, about its conceptualization of gender roles and relationships. Yeah, one is the husband, the other one is the wife. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like there's nothing kind of, you know, in between. And, you know, there is a yeah. kind of a performativity of those gender roles over and over and over and over again, right? Because even in Robin Williams and Nathan Lane's relationship before they have to put something on for the conservative family, they are still playing a husband and wife, really. Yeah. And they refer to each other as husband and wife, really. That's right. But to me, you see, that's part of the joke, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's why when they're in the middle of the dinner party, when basically she, she's so conservative, <laughs> like she clearly uh, hasn't given any thought, Alban hasn't given any thought to any of it, right? Uh, Ar- Armand is what they call him in this film? Armand is Robin Williams. Okay, and... Oh, uh, you want Nathan Lane's Nathan character? Nathan Lane is... Because in the French movie, it was Albin and... Uh, Albert. Albert, okay. So I saw that first. Um, you know, <laughs> when they have that conversation about abortion, kill the mother, you know, let her go down with the ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs> right? I mean... Yeah. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So, uh, but, you know, I think it's comedy, right? And it's kind of... And it's playing with different things. You can't be literal about kind of everything. I think those things would be a problem, but I, I don't think they should be, really. I mean, mm. so on the one hand, they are playing, like, it is very heteronormative in the sense that even within queer relationships, yeah, it's seen as a binary. But on the other hand, the very act of constantly performing it is kind of demonstrates how it's constructed, really, and how it's learned. And, you know, I mean, I think the scenes with Gene Hackman and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Albert, are hilarious, really, you know, when he finds himself kind of falling for him, her, right, kind of, you know, I I think it's kind of genius, you know, the way that it's played, actually. I had a problem with the son, Um, and obviously the son is a kind of, in a sense, he's he's an antagonist for a long time, because at least he's a central kind of source of tension and drama in the film, because he's the one who kind of insists that his parents need to play straight, to appease his fiance's parents, and like it totally makes sense in the drama, right? And it totally makes sense that that you could be that concerned and think, oh well, it's just for one day. It's not unreasonable to have that kind of reaction or have that impulse. Um, but I found the character quite inhumane in the way he went about it. He didn't seem to have very much remorse about it. He was kind of apologetic, but I want, but I felt like he was being kind of unsympathetic to his dad's well to his mom. I mean he's obviously um, 
I wanted to feel more fear in him, basically. Like, it was clear that he was scared, or it was clear he should have been. I wanted to feel it, though. I didn't feel that he was so scared that he was being driven to, basically, you know, it's quite disrespectful what he's asking of them. Um, um, I do, I must say, I didn't feel that way. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at it, in, like, in another way, he's basically just asking uh, his stepfather to stay away for a day. That's all. <laughs> You know, I mean, if you think of the sacrifices that parents make for their children's or actually that are made within families for one, you know, to ask someone to stay away for a day is not the end of the world, right? It's made the end of the world because of who Albert is. But that's the thing, he doesn't ask. He doesn't ask honestly. If he goes to his dad and brings it up, and and even the way he asks his dad is... He's like not uh, not open enough. You know, I just, I did feel... Uh, okay, I, I, basically, yeah. what I felt from the kid was I... I I wanted to feel less like I don't like this guy because ultimately what he's asking is not that unreasonable. It's not very nice, but it's not that unreasonable. And if he asks his parents in a in an honest and open way, I would feel that less. But you remember the story I told you about my mom, what? right? Like, how are you feeling? A bit low. A bit low! <laughs> yeah. Well... Yeah, and that's kind of Albert, I'm right? I'm not saying Albert so... wouldn't explain. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I don't want to make I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill either. The thing is, I don't think that if my wish had been satisfied by the kid's, you know, uh, tone, let's say, um, I don't think that it would have stopped the drama from developing the way it does. Like, I think you could have still had the film if the kid had behaved just slightly differently. Okay, let me reframe this a little bit because. Yeah. I mean, I do think, I think that a film that makes me laugh that hard and that big and that often already earns, yeah, kudos, right? Like, it's, it's a, a huge laugh every 30 seconds, practically. But I do think that there is something about aspects not being true somehow, yeah? Mm-hmm. You know, so that it does have, so obviously it's theatrical and so on, and it's very heightened, it's very stylized. You know, but I think the whole point of art is to get through that stylization, you know, or artifice to some kind of truth, really. And that, it's, I never felt, yeah? So maybe there's something else there. I mean, you know, I don't think that uh, the son is so in love with Calista Flockhart that, you know, uh, he'll destroy, like, yeah, the mm-hmm. bad line, how many lives do you have to destroy? <laughs> yeah, I, I never felt that. Also... The thing with the mother, I didn't believe. I didn't believe a the mother. The birth mother, you mean? Sorry. The birth mother. The biolog- the Christine Baranski character. I don't. I don't. Don't believe a birth mother could be living ten miles away, and have never seen her son in twenty years. I don't believe. Oh, that. I entirely believe that. Can you? Yeah, I'm sure. It's, I'm sure that happens a lot. Really? Mm. Okay. Well, I found that hard to believe, um, especially when the parents got a long way. Well, that that is that does make it a little bit less believable. I must say. Um, I mean, I can imagine her not being involved in her son's life. I, c- I can't quite imagine her not ever speaking to the dad yeah. for 20 years well, if, they, yeah. if they got along. So, yeah. so you see, that kind of didn't quite wash with me. But it is a farce. I mean, what comes across most clearly and most movingly is the love between the Robin Williams character and the... Um, Nathan Lane. Nathan Lane, yeah. Mm. And actually, that ease, that depth of feeling, you know, that comes across super clearly. And actually... That was a kind of, um, even in 1996, that was a statement to make, yeah? That Mm. this kind of love and feeling amongst two people who are already old, who are not very attractive, yeah? So that Mm. uh, is a value. Um, So am I rethinking? I'm just thinking aloud now, because on the one hand, I do think it's a comic masterpiece. On the other hand, I'm asking myself now, is it really? (laughs) It is, it is. Uh, Yeah. uh, Definitely is. It made you laugh so hard, and and every and like I say, not you know. Sometimes you laugh at stuff that ain't funny, but this was all funny. <laughs> well, I always, I always laugh at stuff that's funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you always laugh at me, uh, which is why I question your judgment. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about your response to it in nineteen ninety six, as best you can remember. Actually, I saw it with Victor Perkins in Coventry at one of those huge multiplexes. And he thought it was a great film, which, you know, for Victor was, I mean, 
I've never heard him say that before. Right. About some a film that wasn't more than 40 years old. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, I think he loved the same films over and over again and increasingly intensely. Yeah, the Magnificent Ambersons, kind of Nicholas Ray films, O Fools films, things like that. Uh, but I'd never heard him say that about a contemporary film. And, you know, uh, uh, mm. you know, he thought it was like terrific. And I think a lot of that really has to be the writing, you know, the writing and the performing. I mean, I think Elaine May really must take a great deal of credit for this. Uh, I'm not taking anything away from um, Mike Nichols. You know, you, he is directing kind of these performances and he's giving them space. In fact, there was a shot, two, well, two shots, actually, that I saw 25 years ago. I've not seen this film since. And I remember them, you know, and that was like the opening, yeah, where you're going through all this ocean right into the birdcage and inside. Boogie Nights, long take into yeah. the club. The image of Nathan Lane as Judy Garland, <laughs> right, from A Star is Born with the Freckles, right? Yeah. I mean, that got a laugh from me, just, you know, the recognition is so funny. Um, and uh, uh, the shot of Christine Baranski on the bridge. Helicopter shot. The helicopter shot going back, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, those I've never forgotten. Um, there were things that I hadn't noticed the first time that I thought were hilarious, right? Like, so, you know, when they're in Christine Baranski's waiting room and he's reading a book called something all about butts, <laughs> something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So kind of, you know, he's reading this book all about butts and the secretary is reading Nietzsche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I thought that was heaven, really. Uh, yeah. I keep thinking about the composition of the shots, where you know, just simple things like choosing an interesting or evocative place to put the camera, like um, when Ron Williams goes to see the birth mother, mm. and they end up, you know, sort of getting a bit drunk and flirting together again after these twenty years, mm. and you can actually you can sort of see how they got together twenty years ago, yeah. even though you know he says, oh, I, well, I'll try it for one night, see what the guys are on about, yes. you know, but you can see how they fell into bed together. And as they kind of nearly do again, and the camera is down by her legs, and he's got a, his hand on her legs, and it's just this little subtle thing, but it's right there. Yeah. And you totally, see, you know, in fact, she sits on the desk and crosses her legs. She's got this short skirt on, and you see all the way up her thighs. She's got very, very long legs, and he notices them, and the camera's there to emphasize. You know, it's it really, it's really elegantly it, done, actually. It is, and I love the confidence with which the film moves from farce to musicals you know they burst into song right they burst into song at that seduction scene they burst into song at the dinner mm. right like you know kind of there's enormous ease and fluidity and elegance actually uh in 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 all of that and i also thought that what was interesting is it's a film that lacks meanness <laughs> yeah you know kind of uh even when you're laughing at a pratfall or the Hank Azaria character, right? He's mm. just meant to be a comic turn throughout, right? But he's not dehumanized. You don't laugh at him. You know, you see the interaction with Albert, right? It's very loving and affectionate and, mm. you know, and so on. Um, so you could have been really mean about the Gene Hackman character, but, you know, yeah. you're not. The film isn't, right? The film is often mean about his ideas, but then, you know, the film wins you over about the, uh, with, the with the character, you yeah? know, with, you know... He loves his daughter, kind of, he's attracted to Albert, yeah, the mm. wig at the end. It's always, it's consistently cynical about his politics and about the way politics is performed. Yes. And the way that the media is involved as well. It's consistently cynical about that. But if he hasn't won you over by, you know, as you say, he loves his daughter and he gets on with Albert and he's such a sucker that he doesn't mm. see, you know, whereas his wife is clearly suspicious of, um, of, mm. of Albert. Um, if he hasn't kind of won you over in some way, he definitely will... When you see him in drag. Yeah. And again, that's really kind of wonderfully done, you know, because they don't turn him, they don't turn his drag into a comic turn, right? He looks so vulnerable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the moment of where with him, you know, he looks smashing actually, but he also looks like deeply vulnerable. Like you feel for him at that moment. Yeah. right? And he's hurt that no one will dance with him. Yeah. <laughs> and he really is hurt. Yes, you know? he is. Poor guy. So, um, I had seen uh, La Cage of Fall, the Edward Molinaro film, with this genius French actor. What's his name? 
Michel Serrault? Yeah, yeah, Michel Serrault playing Albin. And, you know, that was brilliant. But actually, the, you know, the, film, the films are quite problematic in a lot of ways. They're much more problematic than this one. But I saw all three of them. <laughs> in one, he goes to uh, Ugo Tognazzi's family in Italy, right? And they have to do the, wine har- the, the, the wine harvest, the grape harvest for the wine, which is, you know, quite hilarious. But there is something, you know, if you think this is problematic or this would kind of raise a Twitter, that would even more so. You know, um, but the reason, that, like I, said, I just want, I want to clarify that when I say I think it would raise a bit of a Twitter storm, I would be criticizing Twitter for that. Yes, yes. But, I mean, I think this is a really fair, even-handed, fun, humane movie that doesn't, yeah. have, as you said, doesn't have a bad word to say about anyone. Yeah, and actually, it, it takes these characters, some of whom are really broad stereotypes in some respects, and shows you their humanity and shows you yeah, that they're, they they're, can get hurt and their people and all this. Yeah, they're all huge stereotypes, actually. <laughs> um, but the film kind of goes beyond that. Uh, anyway, and I, I also saw the Broadway show that was based on yeah, those French films, the musical. Actually, Nikki and I saw it performed in Buenos Aires. <laughs> yes, by a great singer. You know, whose name I now forget, but this most incredible voice, actually, kind of uh, on stage, it was, it was fantastic. So this is material that is theatrical through and through. Yeah, and I think the film respects the theatricality of the material mm. and works with it, you know, to great effect, really. It is kind of amazing, I think. So you said, I said some of these are kind of stereotypes. You went, they're all stereotypes, actually. Yes. Do you think they are... Like over, do you think they're overly inauthentic in that? Do you, uh, they, well, I mean, I think it's farce, isn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so you are dealing kind of with highly stylized outre outlines of something, <laughs> right? You know, so um, so I it's kind I, of hard to believe that someone like Nathan Lane actually exists in the world, but a few people do. I mean, you're not a million miles away. <laughs> 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 well, I have seen people who are even closer. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I have no problem believing that people <laughs> like that exist in real life. Though I think in life, gender is much more fluid than the film presents it. Right. Mm. Even in its extremity. So, for example, you know, if um, Albin would have been, you know, kind of somebody who you know, was gender mismatch, let's say, right? Which is kind of almost what you know, the, the persona suggests. You know, then, you know, and you know people who go, th- who have gone through life kind of, you know, wearing um, women's clothing or, you know, kind of wanting to be women and really suffering f- for it, right? Like kind of, you know, when Paris is burning, you see like kind of, you know, people are murdered before they're 25 or something and, you know, kind of they uh, need money to get their operations and go on. The, yeah. So the thing about Alban, I mean, this is a farce. So in a way, nothing terrible happens. He works in a nightclub. He lives in Palm Beach. Yeah. yeah he can wear what he like. Yeah. So, you know, that's the sunniness of the film. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, if you put that in any major city in the world, he's somebody who would probably have been beaten up a lot of times, who would have suffered terrible discrimination. There would have been a lot more hurt. Though I think Nathan Lane is very good at also communicating a kind of hurt. You know? mm. There's an incredible subtlety in the performances that Robin Williams and Nathan Lane give, and it's partially in that, but it's also physically. Look at the way they move. Yes. Yeah, so there's, one that, that, there's an example that's quite obvious, which is where Nathan Lane comes in dressed in a suit, and he's tried to match their expectations, tried to match what they want, um, and you know, then he starts to walk. And it's that campy walk, and then he turns it into a masculine walk, and then he sits down, and he sits down in a campy way, then he turns it into a masculine way. Very obvious the way he's changing his oh, performance yeah. there. But then also you see it throughout the film with Robin Williams, and mm-hmm. it's much more subtle because he's not trying to behave any particular way when he is being himself. He just that's the way he is, and then he changes in order to uh, you know, try and be the, the father, the man of the house when the conservative parents arrive. And it's easier for him. He has a better handle on it than Nathan Lane does. But still, you see in his performance there's there's a, there's a stiffness to it that he he, you know, he 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 doesn't feel free in there. I was going to say, though, I immediately backtrack in my head because what I was going to say is that Robin Williams gives the greater performance, you know, because it's so subtle, and actually, you know, sometimes it'll just be a shift in his eyes, 
and you can see this hurt right from his son or mm -hmm. yeah like and and actually it's he doesn't do anything it's almost like his eyes cloud over or something right like mm -hmm. it, it's it's so yeah subtle and minute what he does but you feel it yeah, yeah. You, you feel what he feels really right whereas nathan lane's performance is a more theatrical one actually i think no less greater and maybe even greater yeah but it's a theatrical one it's kind of you know it's made out of intonations of voice out of you know the way you say lines about the way you hold body about costuming right so so okay let me put it another way they're both great performances <laughs> but one is very external and the other one is very interior mm. you know i mean yeah also external like yeah, there's a little nuances of hand gestures and so on yeah but it's mostly an internal performance you really see into his mind yeah like yeah uh so Anyway, it, it's a great film. I'm really, really glad I've yeah. seen it. It's fucking funny. Yes, I highly recommend it. All right, well, on that note, uh, we are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on... Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>